Good morning, everybody. Hi, my name is Philip. I'm on the product marketing team here at Tulip, and I'm excited to be the MC for Ballroom B. And today, we're going to start the second session. It's, going, it's titled Strategies for Fostering a Culture of Continuous Improvement in GXP Environments. So thank you for make, taking the time out of your day to come here. Um, just to orient yourself to the space if you haven't already, there's refreshments out on the right, and then there's a restroom out uh, to the left. And then later today at 3.30 p.m. in this area, we'll have a life sciences mixer if you'd like to attend. So now, without further ado, I'll hand off to the moderator for this session, Michelle Bolo. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here with a group of um, panelists here that are um, appointed uh, experts in TULIP, but also, I think, continuous improvement. Um, just to start off, uh, I'm the head of quality for Tulip. Um, been here about four years. Um, we have here Kosi Arrow from Omni Labs, uh, Tony Angelito from, um, I'm sorry, Omni, um, you're from. <laughs> On Demand. On Demand Pharma, you're from Omni Labs, and Gabe is from Dent Supply. So we have a broad range of expertise here. And funny enough, I'm just gonna share a quick anecdote is that, um, if nothing else in everyday life tells you that we have to be flexible and agile, today we had even a change in our panel uh, due to a last minute cancellation. So it's interesting to me that we had to um, demonstrate our agility um, even within uh, bringing you great content today. So um, first of all, I just also want to say that so far I'm detecting a theme in this, this, this conference, if you will, um, you know, from the opening presentation remarks from Natan to the keynote speaker this morning about continuous improvement. Um, I think continuous improvement in general is going to be a key success factor in any sort of digital transformation or any transformation or change management. Um, so. Without further ado, I'm going to start getting in. If I would hope that each one of these uh, gentlemen can give like a two-minute introduction as to just to give you some perspective from where they're coming from um, and their journeys. Yep. So my name is Kosi um, at On Demand Pharmaceuticals. We're a startup company that was founded really what, to do what our name says, which is to do more on-demand uh, manufacturing, uh, which is fundamentally a supply chain issue. So. In the past, we've used Tulip for um, what was our on-site like pharma compounding solution for drug shortages, and now we're kind of using it more traditionally in a GMP environment. Uh, my background is in uh, programming and chemical engineering, but also I used to do consulting for operations consultant as well. I'm Tony. Um, I run hardware at Omni Labs, so that covers uh, mechatronics engineering that covers production, uh, basically everything that physical that happens at the company that's my team. Uh, uh, I've implemented Tulip twice now, uh, both for uh, medical device startups. Um, we currently make uh, two robots that we have in Tulip. Uh, there's an autonomous uh, UV disinfection robot um, and basically an uh, autonomous uh, virtual health solution as well. So, Gabriel Corbellini, Gabe, I'm here in Waltham Local. We do patient-specific dental implants uh, from design to order, design to shipping, very fast pace. Uh, I started with Tulip like eight and a half years ago in the beginning of the conception, not knowing how much ad value could be added. And then uh, here we are now, eight years later, with a couple of apps and uh, improving the, the value the value added and the, the value stream, so. That's great, so we have a broad range of expertise here, so it's wonderful to see that. Um, so I'm gonna start our first question. Um, as you know, again, this is all focused on continuous improvement, so the first thing that I wanna understand is what is driving change in your organization? Again, from the, the initial discussion is like, we don't wanna just be doing digital transformation or using new technologies for the case of technology, but really for a reason, right? Like we wanna have a business case. So I'm very interested in understanding from each of your perspectives, what, um, is, what, what what's driving change or what drove change? I guess I'll start. Starting with you. Uh, yeah, yes. I'll start. <laughs> um, yeah, so for us, so as a startup, um, we have these goals to do more on-demand manufacturing. Um, and in really to implement that and to do it at the timelines that we have, 
we need a solution that allow us to control our processes, but also have that quality aspect built into it. Um, and you know that we can make a lot of changes, especially on the GMP and, or before when we had our um, on-site pharmacy compound and solution. Um, so with that, we really you know were defining our processes as we went. So we'll have changes either with recipes or with different things we need to implement, and we'll be able to do it right away for our customers for like the next run the next day. Um, and now as we move to GMP. I think we need a solution that allows us to control processes that were defined and like make those changes readily. Um, so some bit of flexibility was something that was needed um, and our timelines really pushed us to do something that was, you know, that would allow us to control our uh, machines more efficiently and also uh, do it quickly. Um, and the other aspect is just quality. So how can we ensure quality? And a lot of that comes with data capture and being able to trace things throughout the process. Um, that's something that's been really useful for us so we can like kind of really figure out what information we need to collect, change that as we go, and make sure we can track a lot of details about our process, especially in like um, in the pharmacy solution. Like we had a lot of details about the process that they just weren't used to. So when we'll take it to the hospital that was using it, they'll be like, oh, you know all this. This is a lot more than we even get from our own pharmacies. Um, but we were able to quickly do it within the Tulip environment. The only difference in the GMP environment is you have to do the validation process. So you can still have the same tools, but you have to validate it. Um, but So that's kind of like high level what um, we had. What about you, Tony? Uh, regulators, mostly. Yeah, that's um, regulatory actions. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how many people would go through the process if they weren't required to, to some extent. Mm. Um, but I think the main thing for me is my team. Uh, it's um, my team is younger engineers. Um, they have to learn a lot very quickly. They develop tulip. They run the production lines. They do the design work. Uh, it's, so they need, you know, why Tulip is they needed a tool that they wouldn't rebel if I required them to make the applications in it primarily. And writing QMS documents is usually a good uh, recipe for getting your engineers to rebel against you. So it seemed like a better alternative uh, at the time. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's why Tulip, it's why I did it again is because it's, it's a tool that I like, hey, you know, we have to do these things. Um, we want to be committed to quality, but the, the team, it, it, you know, it's, it's work for sure, but it's like I can build a framework and the team feels like they can participate and they can own it. Uh, they can drive it to a meaningful conclusion. So I would say that the team component is probably the biggest thing for us. Great. So I see customer experience as us. For us, customer experience is everything. Who is the customer? Is my can be the patient receiving the implant, the doctor that in, doing the implant, the lab that prepare everything to the doctor, and my 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 team internally. How can you make their life easier, faster, of course cheaper in the end, and deliver what they want? So that's why it's a constant, small step every day to keep improving, and uh, with tools that we have, like Tulip can help from permanent apps and the disposable apps. That we'll talk yes, later. we will get to the disposable <laughs> apps for sure. Well, I think what's interesting about your situation is you are dealing with a lot of an N of one, right? And so efficiency yes. gains are something that you need to do. We never do the same product twice. It's right. one time only goes through the process, yes, yeah. and go to the mouth of the patient, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so efficiency gains. It's interesting because, you know, sometimes, you know, people like technology or IT or people like the directive comes down that you're going to be using this new tool or there's regulatory um, commitments that you've agreed to or, you know, there's, there's usually there's something that's motivating or driving the change and it looks like we've kind of covered like a few of those. Sometimes even new leadership comes in to, um, to drive and motivate change. Um, I guess... The next question would be more about um, what it's like a pivotal moment in your journey here um, where you took action that significantly shifted the way you, the organization was seeing change, right? Because change is hard. 
especially in regulated environments, there's usually a lot of resistance to change, um, even if it's under the guise of continuous improvement. Like, what were sort of actions or things that you've done in your in your um, in your journeys that have really kind of helped shift that change? Yep. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll just yeah, we'll just keep the line. <laughs> Super. Um, yeah. So I think one of the things since just based on our journey and also me not being as familiar with the GMP environment, we just had to bring in validation earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so I relied on our validation team. I had to ask them a lot of questions to try to understand, all right, we did this app in like an unregulated environment. Like what's the difference? Like what needs to change? And what do we have to like change about the way we structure um, what we did before? And that just helped because like we started answering questions beforehand before we started even building the apps and structuring things like the back end to make sure we can answer those questions and get to the, um, be able to actually have our validated um, apps at the end. So I think that was key. Um, and it's gonna be interesting how we kind of like develop a standard where that's kind of like, you know, standardize that approach. Cause I think doing it the first time is one thing, but then how do you make sure that there's a, um, a way to kind of keep it going. Um, previously as a consultant, and I think I heard it in the um, in the next uh, in the previous uh, meeting there, but bringing in tiered reviews. So, as an operations consultant, you get brought in to like do things like you know improve a plant, do downtime reductions, and that's all well and good if you reach your project target. But typically, what we find is you come back to those plants maybe a year later, and you're like, uh, you guys, efficiency has dropped. What happened? Um, so Tulip, I think. Just from my point of view, Tulip can help get some of that information, like make that more readily available. But if you don't have a way for people to discuss it and make sure everyone across the plant is kind of reviewing that information in some systemized fashion, it's hard to keep up with any of those improvements that you've made. Um, so every time, like for us to complete a project, we'll have to set up a structure for tiered reviews. So I think that's kind of helped just sustain it. Um, some of those things. Follow on question to that. Do you think that that's also part of like building champions into the project as you go along with these tiered reviews? Is like oh. ag getting agents of change to kind of. Yeah, de definitely. I think, I mean, I think most plants nowadays have someone who's assigned to that, but yeah. then they also have to be passionate about it. So it's not just like a job, but it's like, because there's so many things, especially in a plant, like a conversation can have a lot of information that's there within technicians, right? Yep. Or operators. Um, but yeah, so someone there who's able to like make sure like things are being done properly. Um, yep. All right, I'm gonna go out of order this time just to mix it up. <laughs> so, how about you, Gabe? So I, I came from automotive and military. So, and I, and I landed just mad device class one and two to change the way to see things. And uh, IT and regulatory, that's the first thing is, no. No, no, I cannot do that. You need validation, it's to myself that no for me is not an answer. <laughs> and you need to have the, understand the end of the, end of the game and the end of the tunnel and keep insisting. And then the, the, the champion needs to, be, needs to be a believer and like a very stubborn believer that I need to change this is better and keep insisting that the new becomes the old and then that's the new, the new thing that people is naturally are doing without going back to the past. Otherwise, you go back to the, you get out of the factory and a year later we are doing the same thing over and over again because it's not a habit or maybe or something. So for me, no, so I see everybody around the product, the customer or the patient as a support. So no is not an answer like the, the, you are supporting the product pays your, and then you need help to change that. So let's, let's look at the, the rules, let's look at the regulations, and see what can be done to be faster, easier to everybody. I would say two things. Um, I think when you adopt a tool like Tulip, or you have a, an initiative like this, it, the, a lot of times people will want to jump to, well, whose job is this going to be? You know, who's, and, it's every, and it's gotta be everybody's job. You know, there's somebody who has to be responsible for the project is on time and in budget and et cetera. But um, the first thing I did with my team is you're all going through the training. You're all developing apps. You're all 
going to understand how the system works. You're going to build the apps for the parts that you make and the stations that you own. And you're going to own it soup to nuts. And it did a couple of things for my team where nobody felt overwhelmed at the idea of Tulip will need to be rolled out. And uh, we did the first rollout in about six months. Uh, and we were able to get the second product in the system to the same level in about a month after that. Uh, so we just did that. And it was because everybody had gone through the training. They'd done it once. They understood that the burden would be shared across the entire team. Um, there wouldn't be a tulip guy. Um, you were all going to do it. You were all, if you own a part, you own a station, you make the tulip apps, they're your responsibility. They get audited. You know, you're responsible for the changes. Um, so that was, I would say, the biggest thing, because uh, you immediately have that shared accountability. Uh, I would say the second thing was it was kind of my idea to bring Tulip on, and I also think that there's a lot of uh, pressure as a manager or a director to be like, well, well, I did all the work to make the decision, and that's where my job stops. Um, so the, the other thing that I did is I went through the training with them again because the training had been very different from the last time I had done it. Um, I did the first apps, you know, I did the workshop and I walked them through. I did video calls with everybody on the team. I'm just like, this is my development process. I went through the whole workflow. Um, I'm not saying that they have to do it this way, but it, you know, it showed them that it's not, um, you know, it's an organic process, you know, and that, you know, A, that I have the knowledge and I'll be here to support you and um, you'll have each other after, you know, uh, going through the process. So um, I think that makes a big difference. Uh, uh. So it's interesting. There's a lot of little tidbits in there. And so I'm going to sort of generalize some of the things that I heard, mostly because, of course, we're at a tool of conference, but a lot of these things can be applied to any change, any <laughs> digital transformation journey or any change in general. So like a couple of things, um, I like the tiered reviews, right? It's just kind of like small increments. This gets to the sort of that agile, sort of continuous improvement focus. Um, I like the insistence. <laughs> no is not an answer. Like that's great, right? Like you have to persevere. Um, change is hard. It's difficult. It's a human thing to kind of resist it. Um, so I do like that, you know, perseverance is part of it. It's sort of, this is like the softer side of it. Um, also educate and upskill, right? Like I think, again, that's so very important. Um, I always go back, I had a conversation earlier this morning um, about risk. I will always refer back to risk in my thinking and approach, but like the less you know about a particular topic, the more conservative you're going to be, the less ad the advert, like the more adverse you're going to be to taking risks. So I think education and upskilling is a really great uh, opportunity to help bring people to the change and make it less, um, I don't know, less scary maybe. Um, and uh, just driving engagement through ownership. I think that was also a really great uh, thing that you mentioned there. Um, because if you don't own something, it's very, it could be very hands off and not maybe care about the outcome so much, but if it's something that you own and you're building yourself, that is a great way to kind of foster that environment of continuous improvement. Um, so many great things there. One of the things that I didn't hear, I was wondering, um, I don't like top down or bottom up. Like I could probably discern that from some of what you said, like both, like what, what, like, is it more of a top-down approach or bottom-up, sort of grassrootsy, or like, it's or a hybrid approach for pushing these changes? Or yeah, I mean, I think from the top there has to be. I mean, if there's general buy-in in terms of the direction, that really helps mm -hmm. because that's easier to like talk to your colleagues and get other people aligned to whatever um, you know, whatever you might be advocating. If you're the guy from IT or from um, that's you know building the tulip paps so it really does help because um, i think in our situation that there is that buy-in so there's not a like, question as to whether we need to do this in tulip it's more about like all right what is the scope of you know where tulip is going to come in versus how are we going to keep every like just it's more about where do we draw the line rather than like are we going to like implement digital transformation um, so i think that does help so the top down and then bottom up 
I think those conversations you have with your colleagues, really showing them like we have people in, like people who are chemists who have these processes that maybe they just have to like push pumps and like do all these things and they're more used to more traditional ways to run their process and the value we can bring. I mean, if all they have to do is think about the chemistry, they'll, they'll always welcome that if they don't have to like operate equipment and things of that nature. Um, so that really helps it with your colleagues. If it's more automation, less work for them. Yeah, they usually get bought in pretty quickly. Cool. Um, all right, I'm going to jump on to the next one because what I really want everyone here to be able to do is take home some practical tips or practical examples. So the last question um, is about what practical steps helped your org sustain a culture, sustain a culture of continuous improvement. So Gabe, I'm going to go to you because I think you have a really great example of one of the things which is sort of different is, um, that I've been, than I've heard. What have you done? <laughs> <laughs> now, we, I think if, we, if any problem that needs to be attacked fast and with emotion, right? Like if it's happening now, go, go to the place, go to Gamble, everybody says, go see what's the problem and try to get, collect data. We don't have data all the time. So sometimes there's one department against the other department, there's one process against the other process, and the data is not there because the data that you have doesn't tell. So then goes to the can we create something that fast collect data for a period of time, two weeks, three weeks, a month, and with that data we can and keep the momentum happening fast, collect that, we do the disposable apps, that one day maybe will become an app that you need. Maybe become an app that is driving designers to go through the queue and is stopping cherry picking the, the design that they want to do. That can happen, also become a permanent app or it's just an app to collect data right away that is easy to everybody. They use it in a, in a normal environment without changing what they do daily. And with that data, do the improvement and dispose the app. You don't like the disposal, but you don't need that app. Just scratch and go to the, and that, and then that process is, is better. Stabilize, document everything, and then go to the next problem. Maybe it's not in the same operation. It's another bottleneck or something like that. That's very That's the approach, yeah. It needs to be fast and take the emotion in place and help people improve. Build something quick, get data from it, use it to uh, motivate additional... If you companies. don't have the data. If yeah. you have the data, fine. But normally, yeah. sometimes inside the operations, you don't have that data, the data that you have, the standard data. So that's, that's a process, that's an approach, right? Like, how often do you use this? Who uses it? Can anyone bring it up? Or, like, how, how does that... Has, does somebody just come to you with an idea and say, hey, let's... Uh, the first is the problem. We have a yeah. problem and yeah. maybe we have conflict, then that's where we decide what needs to be done yeah. on the spot, right? Like with the engineers and the team and the supervisors and what's your pain, let's fix that pain. Because we try to be... Our pace is fast, so 30 minutes in the, if you delay 30 minutes in anything, we are done for the day. So we need, we need to ship every, everything every day, and every day is a new day. <laughs> so, so from design to order, it's super fast. Yeah. So. Interesting. Why don't we go this way? Um, I would say revision everything is super important. Um, so obviously you have your app revisions, but um, we have system revisions, which are defined by our QMS, so um, with a very specific goal and very specific timelines. So we have a sprint, we work on a sprint schedule. So um, I'm fortunate now in this operation that we, my production capacity is in excess of what actually needs to be done, but uh, mostly because I drive my team to get the <coughs> cycle times on everything down quite a bit. Um, so revision everything, and then you sort of have this organic recap from your sprints where it's just like, hey, we did everything. I would say put the app feedback in the apps, put the quality events in your apps. It's easy to review everything at the end of it. Um, revision your system. So obviously you have app level revisions, but revision your system. So this is the system that we used as of this sprint. This was all the feedback that we had, um, that we had collected. Uh, this is the P0s, the P1s, the direct action items, the assignments. Um, I want all, you know, we want all these things done before the next sprint. Um, 
you know, I think that that is important where it's, it's easy to kind of say, well, we have a good revision process at the lowest level and kind of the app level. Well, we have kind of a revision process for maybe our top level QMS docs. And then everything kind of gets lost in the sauce in the middle and you never really develop a good architecture around managing the changes. So I think that that's important. It just gives people something to rally around. People like saying, oh, we're working on this revision. It's whatever your scheme is or this name of a part or an assembly. And you know, it's easy to kind of just rally the team around that uh, if they have a name for it. Um. Maybe I missed it, but what are your what are your sprint cycles? We sprint uh, when we and uh, when we need to on production, but generally we'll do it by the two week uh, sprint. So, um, and we'll, that's the only meeting we have as a team as well. So we're either meeting to produce parts, produce product, or we meet uh, every other week to just say, hey, you know, this is what we're going to get done in the next two weeks and. Did we get it done or not? Uh, what I what I do love about that is like you are holding accountable people for this like things to get done at the next time period, right? Versus I, you know, having sat in like in life sciences pharma for a long time, that evolution of utilizing sprints was not a muscle, right? Like it was yeah. not something that was executed very well, and I think it it not only forces people to be sort of Accountable to those periods, but also gets them in that sort of that that, that that momentum cycle of we are delivering smaller pieces of work versus having to wait six months a year before delivering some some package of value. Yep. Um, it's very interesting. Um, what about you? Yeah. So I think earlier I mentioned bringing in validation, yep. um, and I think the change won't be implemented if it's like hard. To implement so the process of like implementing it is hard and so if you have a process that's easy to validate or if you have a suite of apps that's easy to validate um, it'll be easier to keep changing and making improvements as you identify so if you identify something that needs to be changed um, and so one of the things we had experience with is you know tulip is pretty open it's pretty flexible so you can you know um, choose how you implement your solutions, and there's lots of ways to implement solutions. How we did it the first time wasn't the most efficient for Tulip, uh, and what that means is when you go to try to validate a system like that, there's gonna be a lot more testing that needs to be done, and that's gonna be a lot harder, even like, you know, we didn't have standards at first when we first started, so like taking someone else's apps and trying to review it, debug it, figure out all the things that went wrong after they're handing over, makes that process cumbersome. Um, once we started with our GMP apps, um, you know, we followed a much simpler structure. So we built much simpler apps. Logics were a lot simpler, so it wasn't very complex. Um, it was easy to take someone's apps, review it, look at some of the triggers. Bam, it's like, OK, this should do what it's supposed to do, and I can test it without having to figure out all these corner cases. Um, so I think that's the key thing that like we're kind of like wrestling with is like, okay, if we're gonna implement change, if we have a structure, something that's easy to test, something that's easy to get through the validation process, then this is something that we can change frequently. So if we identify something that needs to be changed later, we only have to test like one slide. We don't have to go test like the whole app again because the whole app didn't change um, and nothing's connected like that, so. So that, I, again, I'm gonna go back to generalizing it so it can be applied across. What I'm hearing from that is it's almost changing not only the perception, but the reality around um, how change isn't, doesn't need to be painful, <laughs> right? Like if, if it's not painful, then you're not gonna be averse to do it, right? So yeah. I think that's an important aspect is making, make change easier. Um, it's funny, one thing that I haven't necessarily heard is vision, like having a clear and um, concise vision uh, and mission communicated like for the operations space. Do you, maybe it's just something we haven't brought up yet, but do any, any of you, is that part of something that makes things more effective for? Yeah, I mean, I, it, I mean, it should be in your QMS. I mean, it's, it should be very clearly articulated. Top level, what our quality policy is, what our quality objectives are, how we execute on them. It, you know, it's everything should be tied back to, like no, anybody on my team, I could be like, why? 
why, 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 why? And they can point, you know, well, because the architecture is this, because the data structure is this, because the QMS that we all signed off on says this, um, because the, you know, the reference, the regulations are referenced. You know, every, I have all the regulations printed out for, um, you know, every ISO reg and, you know, GMP and the CFR components that we're required to do and uh, be compliant with. And the teams read them, you know, so they, they you know, you know, you got to have the tie back because it's, I don't, I just, I personally don't like working on something where that why isn't clearly outlined. And I don't like that. I don't want my team to do that either. You know, they should feel very like my work on this is meaningful because, you know, because, 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 because. Um, I think the tie back is super important. I love it. The why, right? Like yeah. don't tell people what to do. Yeah. Tell them why they should be doing exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, we have, we have the company vision and mission mm -hmm. that goes to 16,000 people, very broad, vanilla. It's pretty much the same to everybody, right? And then you have the site that, that there's the site culture, where the site came from, how the site was built, and uh, that, that's the most important, I think, uh, ingrained vision and mission. So we, and we try to make, standardize everything more we cross-train everybody to, to be very productive across the board. So we have people from design coming helping scanning, we have people from scanning helping machining. They need to look the dashboard and from the, the, that tulip information coming out and where do I need to go to help the bottleneck and instead of waiting for parts that and doing nothing because the pace is super fast. That's the agility of the vision and mission that we need to have. How to, and you need to build that to everybody to see that patient is waiting, we don't want to rebook the patient in it, we call it doctor chair, and how can you do that in a 99% performance delivery and all the time. So. Yeah, what I like, I like what, about what you said is that like vision and mission, everybody's got one, right? It's in the QMS, right? I can point to where it is. But really having people in their day-to-day -day lives translate what that means to their job is very, is another very interesting uh, principle, right? Like really forcing people to think, what how do I how do I achieve that on a daily basis? Um, again, I think that can relate to continuous improvement here. Um, I think we're getting close in time, so I'm just there's a couple of questions that I kind of wanted to sort of wrap up with or give everybody another opportunity to kind of give an answer. Is well, what is one thing that you want? Like if if people just walked out of here and don't remember a single word we said or maybe just one line, like what is the one thing that you would tell people that has been most effective for you? Um, and or, you can answer this question, is um, what would your employees, your peers, your managers, whatever, you know, people in your organization, what would they, what words would they use to say about the operational environment? So you can answer either one of those questions. Just something, I think either one of those is something that can take home. It's, it's, and, and for me, it's interesting to self-reflect on what you think your organization would say. And whoever wants to go first can go first. <laughs> well, that's something I'm sure. Uh, first one, training. Do the training yourself. Have your team do the training. Uh, and I would say for the second one, it's just scrappy. That's like the operation needs to execute. I mean, that's, that's all it needs to do. Uh, efficiency and you know the costs and all of that is is something that you look at with hindsight you know after the fact but it's the, the stuff needs to ship you know so I'd say those are the two things um, yeah <laughs> well, I, 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 <laughs> no that's all good uh, so on the first one I think just generally um, simple solutions so whenever you're thinking of a digital um, something digital, some, something new that you're doing, simple solution is best. Um, I even remember from my PhD days, like always trying to automate everything and then you just find out that like, you know, you don't even understand, you need to understand a little bit more about the basics of your process and it's a lot easier to just do simple um, and then kind of layer in kind of the complexity. But. So I think we are fort fortunate in, the, in what we do at, uh, at uh, Atlantis Dent Supply that we call ourselves a software company that makes implants, so in the end. So digital transformation for us is not scary at all. We, that's what's, 
the inception of the companies from the get go 1999 be as digital as automated as possible until it becomes a real part so the team is not scalable at all so they are used to, they want that as soon as you put some manual a paper something manual in the process like that where the problems start to to grow like i need to do this manually really why the software doesn't do this for me and that's the, so that's that's a good thing but then also all the then they start growing this big system with i don't know 53 different interfaces and softwares that communicate and then you bring tulip on top of it <laughs> to, to make easier more user friendly so you need to be insistent you need to believe that that's make you make the life easier i think and then then you see what needs to be done by the rule like regulatory quality and bring them in to help as a support they support you that's great okay so um i think that's all we had here so let's open it up for some questions oh <laughs> Yeah, um, it's a project. I mean, it's I, I manage everything like a project. So it's like it was on the sprint that you did the training that like to do your training in the next two weeks, and you had to sign off on it. And there was like a deliverable to like have your certification like in the ticket on the sp on the sprint. So um, I think that from that perspective. <coughs> Like I went through it, I estimated it's okay, you know, it's going to take the X amount of time. The team has, you know, the workload is this. Um, I think that it honestly was more successful than I anticipated it being. Uh, the adoption was better. I mean, I'm very fortunate where my team is much sharper than I am, so I shouldn't have been that surprised. But, um, <laughs> but exactly, if you only if you do one thing right, it's higher, right? That's about it. Um, but I was surprised that they, they picked it up very quickly. Um, they immediately were building out, you know, corner cases, you know, where it's like, oh, I want to integrate like foot pedals in the stations. Oh, I want um, my station, you know, the, my automated jig that I made to, you know, kind of report out uh, directly to the application rather than having to manually do a bunch of data entry. So like they immediately kind of like latched on to like, oh, like, the things that I wanted to do this whole time and I was complaining about on the line and in production, I have the tools now to do. So um, I think they, I think I was surprised, honestly, by how receptive the whole, the whole team was once they kind of had the, the tools to uh, enact the changes that they wanted to see in production. So just uh, on continuous improvement, so part of this is going to be versioning, right? We touched on version we've got a we've got a couple of apps out there that are in use right we're then going to upgrade that right we're going to version it we're going to make some changes to it and we're going to get that redeployed out how does that have you had any experience around maybe you have an app used in more than one location and maybe there's been some edits to that app that's allowed to be localized like how does revision work pushing that out lightly knowing that maybe a site has made So, for example, we are changing that now because when we start the process, it's two facilities that are kind of twin, twin, twin facility, one in Europe, one here. And uh, because of the IT regulations, oh, you cannot go to the cloud. So we had to have a local implementation in each facility. We came with one app and guess what happened? In Europe, the app went this way and in the US, the app went that way. And this year we are taking now because now we now the company is going full force to the cloud. So now become the cloud is okay, safe. So now we're going to the cloud. So let's go. So that for us is good because now we are making one instance for Tulip, and then we are bringing the app back to <coughs> to one point that's equal for the both sides to standardize what we do in both sides, and then we'll be implementing the the uh, validation change process through the two champions in each side. But we went like one went one way, another one. So now we are bringing that back because now we can use cloud and everybody's in one place. 
and then bring to other sites in Tokyo and then in, in Belgium as well. Yeah, if it is, that's natural, I think. Human being goes to wherever the pain, maybe their pain is not the same than ours, so then we went different route. When you standardize the application globally, it also often it requires you to also standardize the process. So it's often the reason why people are creating slightly different apps is because they're doing the same process. The process is supposed different. to be standardized. So how how do you drive that? Mm, now 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 that we can and now we can measure before I can. Right. I couldn't, right? Before we have the seventy six page process. That's now Tulip also will help guide through the process. That how do I know I, 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 now I can measure if I, if I have one app. Because someone will ask for something that you can, or you can be doing that is a good idea. You cannot be doing that, you are not following the process. So now we can measure. Did, did you then have to work with your local quality teams? Yes. They yeah. process documentation changes yeah. and align? Depending on the product line, one, one site has is the ownership. So like I own one product line in, in, in here, Hassel in Belgium, another one. So then they drive the changes and they roll out. But because now it's totally different, we don't know what's going on and we cannot even measure that thing. We don't even know that they are doing outside of the, the, the validated process, whatever. I think it will be better now. I, I'm sure it would be better. Well, <laughs> that was for Tony about the training. This, you, by the way, like, getting also the quality people and like not only the engineers but the training. But did they do it? Yeah, everybody did it. Yeah, everybody did it. Um, uh, nobody who interacts with Tulip on my team has not gone through all of the app development training. Um, you use the tool. You're familiar with what it can and can't do. Um, everybody went through it. My CTO went through it. You know, it's I, I made everybody do it. It's if you're on the line, you're inspecting the line, you're auditing the line, you're shipping product. You went through the training, um, and I didn't let you on the line if you didn't have the training. I didn't let you use the apps, and and, and then you're useless to me. Um, so, <laughs> and you not know, as a person, obviously, you know. It's, <laughs> Uh, love and care for every member of my team equally. Uh, if, uh, they if they train. <laughs> if they train. Uh, as, as my dad likes to say, it's a lot like picking your favorite child. I don't like any of you that much. Uh, so um, everybody went through it. Um, I, I think that that is, if you have a lot of resistance to that, it can be very challenging. Um, I think the, the the setting the example I think is is always the best. You know, it's like I went through the training, I did it with you, I did it first. I know exactly what was involved. You know, so I think that that was important. But everybody went through it. Uh, um, so yeah, it's in our QMS. It's in our training log. Everybody knows how to develop apps. You know, when we're doing our skills matrix and things like that. You know. And there is one in the back row. Sorry, I'm trying to go out first. First spot. Right. First row, yes. I have uh, two. One, one would be a quick question for Dave. Can you uh, create those disposable apps? Do you do them in depth instruments, or do you go through and validate the Depending on what I'm trying to track, right? Like one app, if I'm not changing my process, I'm not touching my product, it's just collecting data. Like one department delivering one part to another department? No. Nope. I'm just collecting data, just. And we just what which data do we need, and uh, how to collect that data, and then that's what we do. You know, because it's not touching my process at all. Like it's just collecting data. Then we'll we'll trigger a change maybe to the process. Then then needs validation. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then my other question, I guess, is just for anybody, but how do you manage um, the time that you spend script testing? We, we manage it all in Tulip, so um, we have separate workspaces. Um, things will sit in a validation workspace. Um, 
the data will be segregated. Um, the 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 soak time for the validation, that like the policy around it, is in the, it resides in the QMS, um, but the actual execution of it is all in Tulip, and you have the feedback, you know, and and uh, um, all of those aspects are built into the to the application, similar to like quality events and things like that. Um, is how we do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for good insight. Uh, my question is: uh, Have you been uh, inspected or audited with the scope of Tulip? So, not only the validation of the app, but also the training of the operators, so on and so on. So, have you have you have you been on the inspection audit? We have uh, for ISO. Um, ISO. Uh, we haven't gone through a GMP audit, uh, but generally they like it. I build out um, an audit application, uh, so uh, and I'm just like, this is your this is your app, and you can sit here and and look at the system, uh, and um, they like it. The auditors like it. Um, it's easy, you know, it's easier than just reading through, you know, the, you know, records in your QMS. So um, the training audit, so I mean, we have, um, you know, we use the users. So you'll have the users kind of table um, that you can start with and just say like, hey, you know, these users are trained on these processes only users who are trained on processes have access to those applications. Um, so I think it gives you a really good mechanism for ensuring that only qualified personnel are doing the operations they're supposed to. Uh, is that answers the second part of your question? Yeah, we also, yes, we have, we have audits. We are lucky enough that we have a one layer of defense before Tulip, that's the other software is super well regulated. So then we just touch this one and it's easy to see if there is any discrepancy. And when they audit, they go inside that and they take our information that they need, yes. So um, I, I could probably take one more question and then we have to wrap up. There are any? Sure. What would you say oh. is your one? I've sort of come off as the, the first continuous improvement evangelist, if you will, at my, at my company. And so I'm trying to get a bunch of machinists and operators to buy in. What is your life? Do I, I did this thing and suddenly I had ideas and people making improvement? You have to provide value to them is the main thing. So um, I was just talking about this with somebody where it's like just because a thing is a thing doesn't mean you sell it to everybody the same way. Um, so like somebody who has PL, it's like, oh, we make more money or we lose less money. Somebody who is an operator is like, this is easier than, yeah. you know, somebody who is an engineer is like this is less documentation than you know or whatever the requirements are, um, but it's you just pick one thing. So don't try to you know fix everybody's problem with a unique solution. Find a solution that you think you can you can execute on. Uh, it's just within the scope of your work, and then just sell it differently to everybody and get the you know get that buy-in. Um, once you have one. I find, you know, especially with the machinists, it's like once they're kind of like this guy is advocating, you know, this guy gives a shit, you know, like um, they'll usually, they'll, you know, they're on your team, you know, but until you have something where they've, you know, they've gotten some value out of it, you're just like, oh, great, you know, another person asking me to do my job differently or, you know, so it's, you know, it's. You basically have to tell them what's in it for them. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, make, make, make their life easier. Eliminate the pains. Keep insisting. Find the right one to start testing, not to, because you have the ones that be boycotting you all the time. And every single excuse gives them the tool that they need. Oh, my dash, my keyboard doesn't work. It's simple. Okay, I'm gonna give a Wi-Fi one. I need this new mouse. Here it is. Keep feeding them if they need. They stop complaining, and then you show that their life will be easier after the implementation. And, and learn a lot from them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, learn a lot of them. Yeah. It's, I've been very lucky to work with a lot of veteran operators and engineers, and um, 
they all have a Rolodex of things that they wish were being done differently. Uh, no, yeah, so it, the, the, the content is there. You know, the solution, maybe not, but the content is there. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to wrap up. This has been great. I think even I picked up some tips and tricks and stuff. So even though we're finishing up here, this does not have to be the end of the conversation. Interface with any of these people throughout today, tomorrow, today at the Mixer, um, the Life Sciences Mixer. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for coming and listening to our what we have to say here. Um, I think just one last thing with continuous improvement, right, that I think I've heard a lot, and it's, it's a journey, it's a continuous journey. It's not just a project, you can break them down into small projects, but it's like hooking in your audience, it's really sort of building the momentum, and then it's figuring out a way to sustain this environment of continuous improvement. So I hope you can all spend the rest of the time here learning from each other. Um, thanks again. Mm -hmm.